Um, I wanted to kick off by introducing you to Joel Krieger here. Um, he is going to give us a little more feedback um, on what you're about to see around workshop. And we're re really excited to have him here with us today. I'm going to share more about um, Joel's work with Magic Leaf and throughout his career um, at, during the Q&A. But Joel, can I pass it off to you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Julia. Uh, yeah, so just to set a bit of context here, um, you're going to see a short demo of our newest application, which is called Workshop. And this app is one of two that are included with every Magic Leap 2 device. And the idea here is really just to provide customers with out-of-the-box utility. So you can get started right away and see how AR might unlock value for your business. Um, so Workshop was designed to enable uh, group or multi-user AR scenarios. Now the, the intent here is really all about improving cooperation across teams. So you can use it to enable many different kinds of collaborative group scenarios. Um, our team uses it on almost a daily basis for things like ideation sessions, uh, virtual prototyping. And we also use it a lot to share and review our work in uh, immersive uh, presentations. Um, so as you watch this demo, um, perhaps try to imagine what becomes possible for your business when your teams can collaborate around and also interact with information spatially. Um, yeah, so excited to give you a peek at what we've been working on. And uh, like Julia said, we'll have plenty of time for questions after this short demo. Thanks, Joel. All right, so we're gonna kick off here and I'll start the remote demo. Workshop is a multi-participant tool that brings people together to get things done. Workshop allows teams to ideate, prototype, and solve problems whether they are in the same physical location or participating remotely. In this workshop demo, we will showcase Magic Leap 2's ability to represent geospatial data that features live flight data layered over dimensional terrain. We will also show how you can import 2D and 3D files into work sessions or use annotation tools to co-create with others. Here you will see a map of Los Angeles with real-time air traffic data. These virtual planes represent real aircrafts that are currently in operation. Essentially, live flight data from ADSB Exchange is shown in real-time through 3D aircrafts layered over the terrain map. We can see additional relevant information such as flight details including speed, altitude, aircraft type, and more. This is just an example that we have created to show what is possible when it comes to real-time data visualization. But imagine this is your data, whether it is IoT sensors of machinery in a factory or transportation and logistics. Imagine how powerful it would be to visualize your data spatially. Additionally, we can also use annotation tools such as pins and drawings to bring attention to certain areas on the map. At the heart of workshop is the open canvas where you are able to upload your own files and collaborate. You can upload 2D images, 3D objects, videos, and PDFs to present your ideas in 3D or prototype and iterate together. In this demo, we have a remote participant. She is joining from a different location and you will see her represented by an avatar. Avatars use the Magic Leap 2 sensors and cameras to recreate gaze, eye tracking, expressions, and gestures. Now, let's take a look at the product design use case, for example. Product design teams can review their custom 3D models and 2D assets together. All participants are able to interact with the objects to scale, rotate, and move them around. They can also collaborate and capture new ideas or mark up files using the drawing tool, placing pins or arrows, along with importing multi-page PDFs to give presentations or review in-progress work. In another example, we can imagine how architects, city planners, and real estate developers can evaluate site plans and designs in 3D. 3D objects such as buildings and trees can be moved, manipulated, and scaled to iterate and configure together in session. Upload custom video to evaluate dynamic content such as wind studies, foot traffic, or light patterns. Workshop is now available to be downloaded on Magic Leap 2 devices by going to Featured Apps on your main menu.
All right. Well, thank you guys for watching the uh, remote demo web um, via our webinar here. Um, I, I didn't see too many questions in our Q&A feature, um, but I wanted to quickly introduce some of the folks that we have on the call. If you do have any questions about what you just saw um, or about Magic Leap, please drop them in the Q&A feature now. We'd love to try and address some of those questions. Um, first off, I'm going to introduce Joel here. Uh, Joel Krieger, um, as you met earlier in, on the webinar, is our VP of Design for Magic Leap Solutions, which is an integrated design build team who create in-house AR applications like Workshop and Assist uh, that provide customers with out-of-the-box utility on ML2. Prior to Magic Leap, Joel served as Chief Creative Officer of Second Story, a design studio that blended physical and digital environments. Joel has also previously held design leadership roles at Razorfish and Sapient Nitro, focused on interactive spaces and emerging technologies. So thanks again, Joel, for being here. Quickly, I want to also introduce Chris Herbert. Chris Herbert is our Director of Solutions Engineering. Chris joined Magic Leap in 2018 to manage the volumetric capture team. Um, as well as the MICA Virtual Human Project. Over the next year and a half, you produced multiple experiences uh, for Magic Leap One that were shown at festivals and conferences around the world. Uh, in 2020, he took on management of the engineering efforts within Solutions Design, Magic Leap's first party application development team. And uh, Chris continues in that role today, and he's overseeing the development strategy of all applications the team is building for ML2. So thank you again, Chris, for being here. And then also Jonathan Martin, our VP of uh, Ecosystems here at Magic Leap. Thank you for joining. Um, he leads the team responsible for educating, inspiring, and connecting ML2 developers. Jonathan has over a decade of experience in applied augmented reality development. Uh, his passions and ambitions have led to over a half a dozen pan uh, patents and multiple product deployments throughout his career. Um, and he's really excited to be part um, of a great team that's pioneering some of the world's most innovative uh, enterprise AR deployments. So thank you guys for being here today. Um, wanted to start to kick off with some of the questions we have here in the chat. So Chris, I'm gonna I'm gonna toss to you first. So the, in the chat, the question is, do the models need to be decimated? Yeah, right now, so the models, the 3D models that are supported uh, for upload at the moment are um, GLBs, GLTFs, uh, and um, I think that's it at the moment. We are working to uh, bring in some new uh, model types. Uh, we're working on FBX and OBJ. We would like to get step model supported at some point. That's a pretty tricky format for a number of reasons. Um, we have a 50, gig, uh, 50 megabyte limit right now for model size. Uh, it's, we would also like to open that up, but models, again, like depending on textures, if you have really large textures associated with your models can eat up a tremendous amount of the VRAM very quickly and start to impact the performance. So um, it's not, I'm not able to give like a really clear answer on that because of the, um, you know, the complexities of 3D, but uh, we are thinking of ways to streamline that pipeline and make it easier to bring in more different uh, different types of models. Thanks, Chris, appreciate it. Um, moving on, Joel, this one is for you. Um, is, there a, uh, is this available as a service is the question. Yeah, so it's available for free. Um, I would kind of think about this as a um, kind of a general use way to kind of get your toe in the water with AR and, and Magic Leap 2. Uh, so yeah, we we cover all the the cloud costs and the and the file. So there's re really uh, no fee. You can use it, try it out. You know, I, I think there are limits to where uh, you know it's not a kind of a fully uh, kind of it's not a comprehensive tool in the way that some uh, more commercial applications that you would see out there are. Uh, but yeah, you're you're free to use it as you like. Thanks. Uh, one more question for you, Joel. So, can you talk a little bit about um, if Magic Leap, Magic Leap, excuse me, uses native programming or on an Unreal Engine for a workshop? Yeah, actually, we we did these in Unity, but I'll kick that over to Chris to talk more about the technology there. Yeah, so Unity is the the primary um, engine that we use to build the applications. Uh, Magic Leap does now support Unreal. Uh, but our team is largely um, largely composed of, comprised of uh, Unity engineers at the moment. Thanks, Chris. 
Um, Joel, another another one for you. Um, there's a question in the in the uh, Q and A around a, um, an attendee being curious if there is a sticky note functionality. Uh, not yet, but there there will be. Yeah. So yeah, consider this kind of the first version, uh, and we you know we launched with you know I would I would consider a good general uh, suite of 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 features. We have a lot of stuff. Um, kind of currently being designed or being built that will will begin to roll into the app with I think what Chris like a quarterly cadence at this point. Uh, so so yeah, sticky notes and some other helpful features will be uh, soon to follow. Thanks, Joel. Chris, I, I'm going to toss back to you. So the question we have here is: How are the avatars aligned with the real object in the immersive experience? Yeah, so at the moment, it's a really simple process of if you're a group of people um, in a room together, you align uh, by scanning a QR code. If you are an avatar, you are centering your world space in your own room, and that aligns to the group of people that are co-located um, so that you're all seeing the um, the digital information, the digital content aligned in the space of, in, at the same time in the same places. And, you know, that's all networked so that when somebody grabs an object and pulls it, everybody sees that it, at once. Uh, we're moving toward using uh, spatial anchors, which is a feature in Magic Leap at, at the OS level, um, to do the alignment of the users. Um, but we will probably be rolling that out uh, in another, in probably next quarter release. Um, we'll keep we'll keep uh, we'll keep the Aruco method in there as a backup tool, but we'd really like to get it to a more automated spatial anchor system where you're pushing a map to the other users and sharing the space that way. Excellent, thank you, um, Joel. Back to you. Um, how many people can use um, this you know workshop at the same time? Mm. I don't know if we have an official limit yet, do we, Chris? I think uh, we've tested it. We've tested it with quite a number of people. I would say there is absolutely a limit to where um, things become unmanageable just in terms of the group dynamics, like just as you would expect in a normal meeting when, you know, uh, two's company, three is a crowd. So they're, they're, depending on the type of work you're trying to do um, it, and depending on how many people are in the same room versus remote, um, it can tend to get a little chaotic. Um, it's not really built for you know, like a, like a company all hands type sessions, just too many people. So I would say the sweet spot is probably anywhere between uh, three and seven people. It's, it, it works really well, but I don't know, Chris, if you, if you know, a bet, have a better sense of some of the, the thresholds here. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been in sessions with like 15 to 20 people. And as Joel said, it gets a little unwieldy. Um, Although those have mostly been with the avatar. So it's like, you're not like bumping into each other because they're not real people there with you. Um, and you can start to get a little frame. Those, we'll, the frame rate will start to drop a bit below 60. If you have a lot of content and a lot of avatars at the same time, but it's fairly robust with respect to the number of users. It's really more of a, like a functionality thing in, in my opinion, as Joel said. Thank you guys. Um, Joel, For this one's directed for you. Um, one of our attendees wrote in that it sounded like in the video that the gaze and expression of virtual guests was tracked. Um, this, this attendee understands how gaze would be followed, but is the expression shown as well? And if so, how is this tracked? Yeah, I'll let Chris answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll grab that one. <laughs> so we have a we have an expressions um, s system uh, that is using some deep nets that using the um, using the eye cameras on the device. We're able to and the head pose. We're able to understand. Um, a, we infer a lot of what the avatar is doing, and this work is goes back several years. It really started on ML one with Mica, which was a virtual human project where we were um, tracking, uh, le learned, learned a lot about gaze and learned a lot about what felt real and in, 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 in engaging with a virtual human. And so a lot of that work has been moved into the avatar system for workshop. So it, it, we, we made a very deliberate decision, a kind of, kind of philosophical decision to not try to make the avatars representative of the what a user user looks like, not try to 
you know, make design hair and things like that, but make them really generic and kind of um, minimal. And at the same time, put our energy into making those minimal avatars have a level of expressiveness that I don't think I've seen in, in many other avatar systems. So the, the lip, sync, lip sync is really good. The, um, the tracking of the eyes, the expressiveness, the slight facial movement as people, we, we can detect smile. We have um, some slight uh, modification. Like when you're at rest, the mo that you can tell the avatars, uh, you know, there's some change in that. So it's a, it's a rather sophisticated way of handling the um, facial expressions uh, through the sensors on the Magic Leap device. Thanks, Chris. Um, Joel, can you talk a little bit about segmented dimming and what, you know, what has been enabled on the UI design? Um, there's a, a comment in here from an attendee, the UI for ML2 is really dark, which they find refreshing compared to ML1, which is, um, you know, not able to render black. So um, could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so while our, our focus out of the gate has really just been kind of getting a, a core experience together, um, we have been doing a lot of um, experimentation with segmented dimming and finding it really useful um, in, in situations where you want to um, create a hierarchy, a visual hierarchy. So in the in the demo that you saw, and I actually don't know if it was in the version that we filmed, but um, you know we've been playing with the canvas, which is what you you kind of create this workspace over over like a table or a floor. Uh, and if you want that content to be, you know, let's say you had a cluttered table with lots of stuff on it. Uh, well, you could use segmented dimming to kind of black out that table. So the AR content that appears over it would be very vivid and clear. Um, that's one use case. Um, another one in, in the the assist app, which is a the other app that's available for free with purchase of ML2. Um, uh, there's a kind of a, a floating video um, uh, module and you know we played with making that a little bit um, darker, uh, a little more opaque, so it's just easy to kind of quickly find it, especially if you're working in a very busy uh, kind of environment. Yeah. And Joel, um, combining a couple of questions here, are, can you speak to if there's an ability to group objects and also are the avatars customizable? Um, currently, you cannot group objects. That'll be I think in the next release. Um, so yeah, that'll be just a, a, you could expect a kind of a steady uh, stream of, of improvements and new features with each, with each release. So that I think, I believe is in the next one. Um, and then avatars, uh, yeah, customizable. So, so they're not, and that's intentional. Uh, and I'll get, I'll give a little bit of the thinking as, as to why we landed here. Um, so this is really, you know, meant as, um, as, as a tool that you would, you know, hop in, to and hop out of to get a to get a task done, um, and so we, we're really uh, one one of the um, the visual design director on our team had a really great analogy, you know, to think about it like the cursor that you see on your laptop. You know, it's just kind of a generic input, and it just so happens in in this space, the way that you interact with people and objects when you're not there is an is an avatar. So so we tried to create something that um, enabled people to get in fast. There's no need to customize. I mean, everything about this app experience is how quickly can you get in and experiment and kind of use this in the course of your own work. Um, and so there's there's really we, we don't anticipate any sort of need for people to um, want to want to customize it. Um, although we we do get that that question a lot. Um, we're just trying to focus on uh, giving people a way to to interact. The the we have um, focused primarily also on the co-located experience. Um, I know a lot of the attention automatically goes goes to the avatars, but uh, I kind of look at it as a really useful feature. Um, when it's not there, you notice it. I mean, that's just the reality of work. Most most teams are some some kind of hybrid or remote situation, so it's a it's a practical necessity. But I'm personally really interested in the dynamics of an in person um, workshop session. Thanks, Joel. Um, we are approaching the, the end of the 30 minutes. I think we're going to try and squeeze in two more questions. Um, and then we will try and take um, a snapshot here of all the questions coming in. And hopefully uh, everyone can potentially join another remote demo webinar that we'll have coming up um, in November. Um, Joel, one more for you. And then Chris, I have one more for you. <laughs> we'll move to, to wrap here. Um, 
so Joel, does the quality of the room scan determine whether the avatars will line up um, with the location of the physical person? Can you speak to that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the um, the room scan doesn't really kind of feed into the um, the rationale behind where avatars are placed or they show up. Um, the the in, in assist our our other application um, was really kind of more dependent on this this live meshing of the room. Um, but but here we we just kind of established the primacy of whoever the host is. So whoever created that session, that's kind of the anchor point. And then if people join remotely from somewhere else. Um, as they're entering the session, um, they uh, are asked to place the, the canvas space um, in their room in a place where it makes sense for them. And they're actually able to see um, location previews of the other people that are already in session. So you can kind of rotate the, uh, the canvas, the workspace to, um, to where when you enter, you're going to be in, a, in an ideal spot. So you won't appear over somebody or you won't appear in a crowded spot. You have control um, over where you enter the room. You, um, Chris. This one is for you. Last question. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit more about immersion. Um, this person wrote in um, saying that in the video they they didn't notice any auto automatic um, occlusion when uh, the body part was overlapping um, the three D elements. Is that coming? And um, you know, can you talk a little bit more about the immersion side of things? Yeah. Thanks. That's a that's a great question, and it's something that we talk a lot about. So. Um, Yes, we are working on dynamic occlusion, both within the application uh, to enhance the immersiveness of it. Uh, but also, it's good to note that that video that you saw was shot using another application that our team has built called PhoneCam. Um, and that is a really lightweight, simple way to um, capture the experience of being a magic leap from a third party point of view using either an Android or an iOS phone. Uh, and it's, I, I have to say, I, as a as a as a film guy, like super cool to use. Um, so you, it's very simple. You drop a, a Unity package into whatever Unity project you have, and then run a new build of it for Phone Cam, and then the the phone and the device synchronize uh, and connect, and then you're able to just capture shoot shoot video on the, on a phone as you would capturing anything else. So. That's a separate issue where we would also like to have dynamic occlusion because we know that that's like a real delicate thing to try to shoot around when you're trying to capture capture content like this. The phone cam project is right now internal to Magic Leap, um, but we are looking at rolling that out and making it available uh, more widely in the future. So it's it's kind of a, it's kind of in a, in a beta phase at the moment. But it's a, it's a it's a cool tool. Thank you, Chris. All right. Well, I really want to thank everyone for joining today. All of our attendees. Thank you for the engagement and the Q and A and the um, you know the thoughtful questions here. We hope we've been able to answer a few of your pressing questions. I know um, that there may be more. So again, look out for more Magic Leap webinars coming up here in the future. Also, encourage everyone to visit our MagicLeap.com website and in particular our How to Buy page. If you are interested in testing the waters in AR, it'd be a great opportunity. Uh, we can get you set up. Um, and uh, please do look out for um, more webinars like this so that we can have uh, more engaging conversations. I want to thank Jonathan, Joel, and Chris for joining us today. And thank all of you. Take care. Have a good one. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Thanks.